Children of the Great Depression, Chapter 5, Oki Go Home. During the 1930s, about a quarter of all Americans still lived on far farms, compared with fewer than 2% today. For millions of children growing up on those Depression-era farms, it was a time of hard work, little money, and learning to do without. I have to get up every morning at five and milk six cows and carry in water and cut the wood that, and then eat breakfast and go to school, a North Carolina farm boy wrote to Eleanor Roosevelt. That black boy walked four miles to catch the school bus that took him the rest of the way to his high school in Brayson City. When it rains, I can't go to school, he added, and part of the time I am late. I have done a boy's work ever since I was five years old, wrote a 14-year-old Texas farm girl. This week, I have been breaking land with a sulky one-horse plow and three mules. When I read how you, Mrs. Roosevelt, get $3,000 for each radio broadcast, I can't help but think how unjust the world is. American farmers were the world's most productive, yet they too experienced hard times during the Depression. Because they produced far more than they could sell, huge surpluses piled up. The prices of farm products dropped steadily while taxes on farmers' land and the prices he paid for necessities did not. As a result, the average farmer was paying out more than he took in. Hundreds of thousands of farmers had borrowed money to buy their land and equipment. When they couldn't make payments to the bank, they lost everything through foreclosures and bankruptcy sales. Farm after farm went on the auction block. Slim Collier recalled the day his father took him to a farm foreclosure near Waterloo, Iowa. It was the 1st of March when they were forced off, and all of all their household goods were sold, even family pictures. They went for five cents, ten cents apiece. Quite a few kids were brought by their parents, partly by morbid fascination, partly by sympathy, and well, there was something going on. In those days of no TV, no radio in some places, an event was an event. There were farmers who resisted. If they come to take my farm, I'm going to fight, one man was quoted as saying. I'd rather be killed outright than die by starvation. But before I die, I'm going to set fire to my crops. I'm going to burn my house. I'm going to po poison poison my cattle. Almost half of the nation's farmers did not own any farmland. They lived on and worked land owned by others. They paid rent in cash or with a share of crops that they raised. This system was especially common in the South, where more than a million poor blacks and poor whites labored as tenant, tenants and sharecroppers, with little prospect of ever actually owning a farm or making a decent living. When other kids were just starting kindergarten or first grade, these farmers' children began working in the fields beside their parents. A glimpse of a boy named Tom, the son of a black sharecropper in Alabama, comes from a field study conducted by Smith College economists Catherine Dupree Lumpkin and Dorothy Wolf Douglas. Tom was 12 years old when Lumpkin and Doug Douglas visited the two-room cabin where he lived with his father, mother, and three other children, old enough to make hands or pick cotton. All of them worked for the, for the landowner, along with other sharecropper families living on the same cotton plantation. Tom gets up or is pulled out of bed at four o'clock in the summer by his older brother, who is quicker than he to hear the landlord's bell, the economist wrote. Work for the entire plantation force is from can see to can't see, i.e. from daylight to dark. The bell is their commanding timepiece. 
Tom is a good steady chopper and can do over half a man's work. At picking, he can do two-thirds. Peter, age nine, does considerably less than that. All the children pick with both hands, and at the and by the end of the first season, the lifetime of rhythm of pluck, pluck, drop in the bag is long since established. But now that Tom is taller, he has to stop, he has to stoop so much or move along on his knees while the littlest fo- fellows scramble by with a hardly a bend to them. Tom had attended part of three grades. The Negro school in his district runs for runs four months normally, the white school runs six, but the year 1932-1933 it closed altogether and since then it has been averaging less than three months. Besides, cotton picking season in Alabama runs well into November and after that it is often too cold to go to school without shoes. So from January on Tom and Peter have been taking turns in one pair. Because tenant farmers and sharecroppers worked on land owned by someone else, they could be evicted at the landowner's whim. And that's what happened during the Depression years. Huge farm surpluses were driving down prices. Warehouses were stacked to the rafters with cotton and other crops that could be sold only at a loss. In an effort to reduce the surpluses, the federal government began paying landowners landowners to stop farming on some of their land. While the program helped prop up prices and it had it had the unintended effect of uprooting tenant and sharecropper families. If a landowner had no crop to plant or harvest, then he had no need for sharecroppers or tenants. The gradual introduction of labor saving tractors also eliminated many farm jobs. Throughout the 1930s, tens of thousands of dispossessed tenants and sharecroppers were evicted from their homes. They joined the nation's drifting population of migrant farm laborers, some four million men, women, and children who harvested crops on commercial farms from Maine to California. Meanwhile, as if the nation's economic crisis weren't bad enough, Nature dealt a crippling blow to farmers in the nation's heartland. One of the worst droughts in memory gripped the Great Plains from North Dakota to Texas. Along with the lowest rainfall ever recorded in the region, a succession of blistering heat waves baked the plains. Ponds, streams, and reservoirs dried up. Crops withered in the fields. In some places, staggering livestock, weak and wild-eyed from hunger, bawling helplessly for water, dropped. In some places, staggering livestock, weak and wild-eyed from hunger, bawling helplessly for water, dropped dead in their tracks. Poor farming practices and overgrazing by cattle and sheep had exhausted much of the region's topsoil. As a result, the 1930s drought was unusually destructive. Prairie winds swept down on this loose, dry soil, scooped it up, and carried it into the air as enormous choking clouds of dust. Terrifying winds wind-driven dust storms called black blizzards boiled up from the parched land and rolled across entire states, darkening the sky, advancing at 50 miles an hour, with thousands of fleeing geese, ducks, and smaller birds raced for their lives ahead of the approaching storm. The The dust was so finely powdered and the winds that carried it so strong they could sandblast the paint off the side of the house. The impact is like a shovelful of fine sand flung against the face, wrote Avis D. Carlson in The New Republic. People caught in their own yards grope for the doorstep. Cars come to a standstill, for no light in the world can penetrate that swirling muck.
The darkness is like the end of the world. We live with the dust, eat it, sleep with it, watch it strip us of our possessions and the hope of possessions. The region that was hardest hit hit hardest parts of Kansas, Nebraska, Colorado, Oklahoma, Texas, and New Mexico became known as the Dust Bowl. Roving reporter Rover, Roving reporter Ernie Pyle visited the area area in the summer of 1936. If you would like to have your heart broken, just come out here, he wrote. This is the dust storm country. It is the saddest land I have ever seen. Many fa- farm families managed to stick it out until the drought ended and the rains returned in 1938. But thousands of others baked out and broke their crops and pasture land ruined, felt they had no choice but to abandon their farms and ranches that had been in their families for generations. As many as three and a half million people may have left the Plains states during the Depression years. No one knows the exact number. Some counties lost half their population. The land just blew away, said a Kansas preacher. We had to go somewhere. Many of these Dust Bowl refugees headed for California. Families piled into ancient cars and trucks, everything they owned roped and wired to their vehicles, shy, excited children crowded into back seats and truck beds as they sputtered down dusty highways leading to an unknown land. The refugees came from several different states, but when they arrived on the West Coast... Most people figured they must have come from failed farms in Oklahoma, the area hardest hit by the dust storms. No matter where they were from, they were all lumped together simply as Okies. They had heard a heard glowing reports about California's sunny climate and fertile soil. Many of them had hoped many of them hoped to set up new farms, but when they reached the Golden State, they found that the, they had little chance of ever owning land there. Most California farms were not, were not small family homesteads the migrants had known back in the Midwest. Instead, they were huge commercial operations, factory farms owned by big companies. Some of the Dust Bowl refugees found places for themselves and in and around West Coast cities and towns where they finally joined family members or friends already settled. But a large number of those who had no choice became migrant farmers and labor migrant farm laborers, constantly on the move as they followed California's crops from season to season. Since there were more workers than jobs, migrant families had no choice but to labor in the fields for poverty wages. The ad- Average field hand worked 16 hours a day, seven days a week, and earned $4 a week when work was available. The children of migrant workers even were even worse off than tenant and sharecropper kids because they had no permanent home. They moved with their parents from farm to farm, living in shabby, overcrowded camps provided by farmers or built with the, by the workers themselves. These settlements were called Little Oklahomas or Okievilles. They were also known as ditch camps because they clustered at the sides of roads along which, uh, which ran along the filthy air- irrigation ditches. The typical migratory worker's accommodation consists of a tar paper shanty with no plumbing and no floor, wrote Paul Y. Anderson in The Nation. He he must furnish his own blankets and rustle his own firewood. At the very large ranches, he buys his groceries from the company store, and the prices are high. The children in those wretched families are seldom able to obtain any schooling, and their mortality rate is appalling. There was never enough water in the camps. There were no toilets other than a rare outhouse. So the nearby irrigation ditch was everyone's toilet. Illness, disease, and malnutrition were common. 
during an inspection tour uh, in California's San Joaquin Valley, a social worker found, quote, dozens of children with horribly sore eyes, many cases of cramps, diarrhea, and dysentery, fevers, colds, and sore throats. Along with illness, poverty, and dreadful living conditions, Okies were targets of hostility and contempt that often confront outsiders and that had been heaped on generations of immigrant Mexican, Filipino, Chinese, and Japanese workers who had labored in the fields before them. The ragged, disheveled migrants and their grimy, coughing children were blamed for their poverty. They were shiftless trash who lived like dogs, said one said a California p- physician. Author John Steinbeck captured the har- hardships suffered by the Okies in his best-selling novel, The Grapes of Wrath, published in 1939, which portrays the Joad family from their foreclosed farm in Oklahoma to the promised land of California. Winner of the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction and recognized today as a landmark of American literature, the novel was condemned at the time by California fruit growers who objected to Steinbeck's graphic depiction of the Okie's plight, calling the novel, quote, vile propaganda. Growers burned the book in public and they pressured local bookstores to remove it from their shelves. Children suffered the most from prejudice aimed at Okies. Many kids had missed a lot of schooling because their parents were on the move, and some couldn't read or write along after other kids their age had learned how. When they showed up at local public schools without shoes, wearing dresses made of chicken feed sacks, or baggy overalls held up by ropes, their better-dressed classmates made fun of them. In the school word, schoolyard, they heard shouts of Okie go home. Some teachers decided that the shy, embarrassed Okies, Okie kids, were stupid or R word. At one school, teachers had newcomers sit on the floor, in the floor at the back of the room, while their classmates, children of the local ranchers and townspeople, sat at well equipped desks. Conditions in California's farm labor camps were so bad that the federal government introduced a program that provided decent living conditions for migrants beginning in 1935. More than a dozen federal camps were constructed where families could move into clean one-room cabins or into large tents sitting on wooden platforms and where they had access to flush toilets hot showers, laundry facilities, and in many camps, recreation halls. Over the years, the Okie tents and cabins and shacks outside the federal camps were replaced by more substantial housing. The Gradually, the little Oklahomas were absorbed into towns and cities they bordered, and as this country mobilized for war in 1940, the vast majority of Okie migrants abandoned California's farm factory field, factory farm fields for better paying jobs in the war's war efforts booming defense plants. Okie children stuck it out in at local stuck it out at local schools and even helped build a special school of their own near Bakersfield. As they moved into larger community, they became high school teachers and principals, college professors, business executives, lawyers, research scientists, and engineers, among other trades and professions. Prejudice gave way to respect, and the term Oki, coined by others as a term of abuse, became a badge of honor, affirmation of strength, determination, and pride. Now for the pictures. So the first picture um, is of a boy on the car, and the caption reads, um, a migrant looks out from the back of the car as they travel travel from Muskegee, Oklahoma, to look for work. Or Muskogee, Oklahoma. This is a sharecropper and his family. 
in Alabama. This is a sharecropper sun in a field with a plow. Uh, that is, it's a push plow. That one's not pulled by horses. Uh, this is a cars uh, a lines of evicted sharecroppers or tenant farmers that were um, evicted off of their farms um, in Missouri, and they were along a freeway, along a highway. This is a picture of the sharecropper son, maybe part of that line. This is a picture of that um, black blizzard, the dust storm during the drought and the dust bowl. And this is part of the picture. The other part is over here of a man uh, out in the dust storm. Uh, so the storms would advance at 50 miles per hour, which was which was a very fast, as as fast if not faster than a thunderstorms. And this is a um, an orchard covered in sand from the dust storm. So it might be a fruit or apple orchard or something um, that's covered in dust, sand and dust from the dust storm. This is um, a car of a family driving across the Arizona desert, um, probably going to California. This is one of the um, ditch camps. Um, this you can see them walking across the irrigation uh, ditch, and then the shanties that have been built for them to live in. This is another um, home of an agricultural day worker uh, in Oklahoma. Um, this is one of the federal camps. Uh, this is one of the lab oops, labor camps built by the federal government. So that's the ones that are going to be on the wooden platforms. They're tents, but at least they have water and bathroom facilities, things like that. And it looks like maybe a recreation area for children to play. In. And this is a school picture of kids at a federal government uh, resettlement camp near Oklahoma. Uh, in Marysville, California. And that is the last picture.